I, I like the Chicago Bears. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of a free agent these days because, you know, I grew up a Redskins fan, a Washington fan, but it's been very hard for the last 30 years to uh, yeah. maintain enthusiasm. That's true. Well, you did survive uh, the Daniel Snyder years. Congratulations. <laughs> that is, that's quite, a, quite an accomplishment. Just barely, yeah. <laughs> and, it, you know, in my youth, in my youth, I, I sort of grew up believing that it was a rule, that the Redskins would compete to go to the Super Bowl every year and the Orioles would be in the World Series every yeah. year. Mm-hmm. And uh, those days have long gone. Yeah, the Orioles have fielded a very nice minor league team on a yearly basis, getting ready to send those oh, guys well, elsewhere. They've been, they've been good. I was going to say, come on now. Yeah, they're right there. They'll, they'll, they, got, they got some players now. Yep, they're a contender. Give right. it another year or two, and then as soon as they have to pay them more, <laughs> well, that's the Peter Angelos will send them elsewhere. But that's baseball. Baseball needs a salary cap so that it can be equal for every team like it is in the other sports. Right now, baseball is the only sport that doesn't have one. 100%. Right. Uh, Senator Charles Trump, our guest, he is the judiciary chairman and is a candidate for the state Supreme Court. Charlie, I saw that you officially filed your papers. I did. I filed on uh, January 8th, the first day filing was open. I did not see another name uh, in the filing for for uh, the category you're uh, in, Charlie. Do you have competition? Uh, not that I know of. And uh, the window is, is closing. Saturday was the close. Uh, it is under our law if someone uh, filed and uh, – mailed it and postmarked it by Saturday, then it will still be a valid uh, filing. Uh, if it's So it could come in and, in the mail this week. Mm-hmm. I'll probably wait till the end of the week to uh, exhale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charlie, I, you're one of those people that uh, I don't think I've ever heard someone say a bad thing about. And uh, most people I've talked to have also mentioned how qualified you would be uh, an excellent uh, Supreme Court justice. So there do seem to be an awful lot of people who... Uh, have... Well, it's, that's very flattering, and yeah. it's nice to hear. You know, it's interesting. Justice Bunn, uh, who's uh, running for re-election, she's filed to run for election to the court in the other division, has not, at least as of what the Secretary of State's office has posted so far, has not drawn an opponent either. And mm. it's tell you the truth it's it's all it's all somewhat surprising to me you guys will remember uh, three or four years ago the last time there were open seats on the court there were 10 candidates fi- who filed in each of the two divisions right and so, that, that was after some reforms uh, i think a lot of people thought there was a need for some reform on the supreme court because of some abuses with the budget and such that seems to have calmed down charlie do you think that might have an effect or maybe that had an effect on how many people decided they wanted to run uh, it may. It it may very well. You know, the, the court is a different court now. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, I, I think the Supreme Court is doing a good job managing the judicial branch of our government. So, you know, my campaign for the court has not has not been one where I would uh, seek to, you know, change radically what the current court has been doing in any respect. Uh, I just I think I can make a contribution and and hope people hope to be part of the process of moving that forward. Have you gotten any feedback from any people inside the system as to how the uh, intermediate appellate court is functioning? Uh, yeah, it's, it, we've had reports on it, actually, at the legislature, because, it's as you know, it's a statutory court. We created it um, a few years ago, and uh, ju- judging by uh, case statistics and everything else, it, it is functioning uh, as intended, and uh, they're doing a good job they processing cases, getting them moved along. Uh, there are three three judges on that court, and one of whom uh, one seat is up for election in the uh, this year's election cycle. And Judge Scar, uh, who uh, was appointed for the two year term initially, uh, has indicated publicly he's not he's not going to run. So I think there are two or three candidates who filed for that. Okay. And is there any consideration towards expanding the types of cases that court will uh, receive in the upcoming uh, years, Charlie? Um, we're we're going to tweak. We're going to try to tweak some of that this year with a bill during the regular session, 
just to clarify a few things more than change it. Um, and there are various sections of the code that we are uh, finding that we have to uh, amend to, to accomplish what we uh, sought all along to accomplish with it, and that is channel the vast majority of administrative appeals to the Intermediate Appellate Court rather than the Circuit Court of Canal County. Uh, but in terms of uh, significant or wholesale changes, no. The Republican Party voted to close its primaries over the weekend, uh, effective dis- uh, in uh, 2026. Uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'm not a member of the state executive committee anymore, Rob. I, I was once years ago. Uh, I, I think I would have voted to keep them open to unaffiliated and independent voters. I I don't think you can argue that, you know, for years, for years, the Republicans permitted that when the Democrats did not. And I think it was an advantage for the Republicans. Uh, Over the last 20, 20, 25 years in West Virginia, uh, the the fastest growing section of registrants uh, are those of independent voters. They've outpaced the Republicans and the Democrats. And so I think the executive committee did make a good decision by uh, saying that it wouldn't be effective till after the current election cycle. Matt Miller. Charlie, take me to the decision to run for the Supreme Court at this time. I, I'm going back to the sports reference. Is this something that you've dreamed of as, as a kid on the elementary school playground? Were you, you know, breaking up conflicts and settling matters and dreaming of being on the Supreme Court at some point? Uh, probably not as early as that, Matt, okay. uh, if I'm going to be candid, but it's something I thought about for a long time. And, uh, you know, there were other occasions when I thought about doing it. Uh, and But it, interestingly, to, to your point, I was not thinking that way at all last year until uh, Justice Hutchison surprised me and I think probably everybody else with his announcement at the end of May that he was not going to seek re-election. And uh, so uh, then I, you know, I thought, well, this, this may be the right time. And uh, of course had the obligatory conversations with family and law partners and uh, my colleagues here in the legislature and uh, made a decision uh, last, last year in the summer and to announce that I would be a candidate for the court this year. What is it that you look forward to the most in being a part of the high court here in this state? Uh, well, I love the law. I always have. You know, the reading the law and uh, the uh, examination of cases and facts and the application of facts to the law has always fascinated me. It's been my whole professional life. So, uh, and, and the idea of serving on appell- an appellate court is particularly appealing to me because uh, I I like to think that uh, an appellate court will have and take the time necessary to review in great detail decisions that come before it for review and uh, not not have to shoot from the hip on it, but to to do the legal research and uh, see if the uh, law dictates the result or rulings that are under review, uh, applying, of course, principles of fairness and impartiality to the best of my ability. Jonathan Bodwell. Um, Charlie, I got a quick question. Um, are there some things that you think the appellate court may have gotten wrong in the last couple of years? Things where you looked and said, wait a second, I don't think I would have thought that way. Does that, does that come into your decision to run at all? Uh, no, uh, no, it, well, it's a two-part question. You know, there yes. are, of course, appellate, appellate court decisions uh, that get rendered that uh, that I have disagreed with, but that is not any part of uh, driving force to get me to run. Uh, you know, I think, um, and of course, it, and, unless you're a justice sitting on the court and you've read all the briefs and heard all the arguments, it's it's hard from outside that. Uh, sphere to second guess decisions that uh, the courts render. Uh, but there have been cases where, you know, I've agreed with the dissenting opinion, I think more than the majority opinion. 
But I, on the whole, I think we've got a, a really good court right now serving the state, and I think they're working hard and carefully to try to move the cases along and to render justice for the citizens of West Virginia. So uh, my, my campaign for the court is uh, not, uh, and I wouldn't want it ever to be viewed as a run against anything that the court is doing or has done, you know, recently. Let me ask, just looking at your amazing legislative career, what are, I mean, what, what are, re, in, in recent memory, what are some things that you're really proud of that you guys were able to get, that you guys were able to get done during your tenure, especially as, as a committee chairman? Oh, in, you know, in the Senate, in the 10 years now that, that I've had the honor and privilege of serving the citizens of the Eastern Panhandle in the state Senate, we have transformed uh, the state in many ways. And the list is uh, is longer than we could have in a radio segment to talk about. But uh, significant reforms in our civil justice system. Uh, you know, the, I'm running now uh, in a nonpartisan race. We made all the judicial offices nonpartisan. I think that was a tremendous step forward. We've done other civil justice reforms. We've done labor law reforms. Uh, we have done education reforms. We've raised uh, several times now in the last 10 years uh, teacher pay, uh, state employee pay. We hope this session before it's over to be able to do more of that. Last year, uh, we accomplished something that we only ever were able to talk and dream about, which is cutting uh, by uh, 21 and change percent uh, the personal income tax for the citizens of West Virginia across every single income tax bracket. So I think this, this legislature of the last decade has got a long list of pretty significant accomplishments that are going to position West Virginia well for the future. Charlie, in the Judiciary Committee right now uh, and, and what's going on in the early part of this legislative session, what are some of the, the pressing issues uh, or, the, or the big ticket items, if you will, that you all are working on? Uh, it, it's uh, a number of things. We mentioned already, you know, things we uh, have to tweak with the course of uh, jurisdiction and, and uh, appellate, appellate cases for uh, inter the Intermediate Appellate Court. But there are many things. Our committee has a broad scope of jurisdiction. We deal with all criminal laws, uh, uh, criminal process, election laws, uh, many, many things, constitutional amendments. And uh, we've got actually dozens of those bills and measures that have been introduced again that were going to work through and consider as we move forward in the session. Charlie, I want to ask you about a specific one, SB 417, creating paid parental leave pilot program. Can you get into this one a little bit for us? Yeah, it was, uh, I think that's my bill. Uh, it is. I had, a, I had a similar bill last year that, that didn't get traction. Um, you know, the, the state government is behind the private sector on this, Rob, quite frankly. Uh, so that's a, a pilot project that would uh, authorize paid parental leave. You know, one of the things that we have to do in West Virginia uh, is attract young people and ideally attract talented young people to serve in the state government, various branches and agencies. The private sector is ahead of us on this. Many private companies are offering paid parental leave benefits for moms and in some cases dads. Uh, when they have a child. And uh, I, I think it's time that the state examine that. And, you know, my idea was let's, you know, if we're, if we're not comfortable or sure about enshrining it into law permanently, let's try it as a pilot project and see how it goes and see if it accomplishes what we would desire, which is draw talented young people who are interested in serving the state into service of the citizens of the state at the state government level. What uh, specifically uh, were you thinking in terms of uh, time re in regards to parental leave? Trying to six weeks, 12 weeks? Yeah, I, you know, and I'd be flexible on that. I'm not, you know, uh, politics is the art of compromise. If we could get it moving and get uh, 
and and get some momentum for it, I'd be willing to uh, negotiate on that and see, you know, what what enables it to get across the finish line uh, so that we could have that experiment with uh, our young state employees. You know, by and large young, I mean, I suppose you can have older older state employees who adopt a child or have a child later in life. But first of all, it's recognized that, you know, the um, the importance of, of that time after the birth of a child for family bonding, uh, it, it is really important. And uh, one of the things we've got to do in West Virginia, we, you know, we've turned, we've turned the net migration number around. For the last two or three years, we had more people moving into West Virginia than have moved out. And that's great. That's the, it's the first time in my adult life, I'm 63, uh, that I can remember that happening. Our population is still in decline a little bit because our deaths are outpacing our births. And we need to draw some young people to West Virginia and keep some young people here and have them starting families. Does this bill have any legs and, and support behind it, Charlie? Uh, well, if I had that crystal ball, I would surely tell you the answer, but I don't know. Uh, it didn't, it did not last year, but, uh, you know, every year when the session starts, it's a time of optimism for me. None of my bills have been killed by anybody yet. And uh, all things are still possible. So we'll see. I hope so. I want to ask you about SB 185, providing a number of state troopers and counties be based on the 2020 census. Uh, we know here in the eastern panhandle there is a lack of state troopers. There's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, is uh, is this bill something that would uh, maybe be the first step in helping to fix that or address it? Well, that was my intention in drafting it and introducing it. Uh, as you know, uh, I mean, proportionally, the Eastern Panhandle is understaffed. We have great troopers who are here, but I think what goes on at, with the state police uh, brass is that they know uh, that, you know, Berkeley County has an excellent sheriff's department, as do the other Eastern Panhandle counties. The city of Martinsburg has a pretty formidable municipal police department. And I, I think what happens is they – the state police think, well, we, you know, because of that, maybe we can allocate troopers to other places where they don't have those things. But our growth in the Eastern Panhandle, uh, I don't think should uh, should be something that uh, is ignored. And um, you know, there are a couple problems there. One is the allocation of the troopers, but number two is the overall size of the force. Uh, we we probably need a bigger state police force than we've got, and that's something we're going to have to work on and look at in the context of the budget. You know, um, we have been losing state police officers to other agencies, other states, but even to uh, things like campus, secu campus security at Shepherd College. And there was a time in my life when that never would have happened. You know, if you were a state police officer, you were in, you stayed till retirement, uh, but we we've got some we've got some work to do in that area. Does the bill address anything in regards to the lack of desire for state troopers to be located in the Eastern Panhandle? One, it might be a great distance from where they uh, are based, and two, because of the pay disparities up here, uh, your buck doesn't go as far when you're trying to buy a house in the Eastern Panhandle as opposed to elsewhere in the state, Charlie. I think that's absolutely true. I think it applies in the state police just as it applies in everything else. Child protective services workers, public school teachers, uh, across you know correctional officers in our correctional facilities and jails across the board. Uh, our cost of living in the Eastern Panhandle is substantially higher, and uh, that you know that creates its own set of challenges for us. Does the bill address any of that? Uh, it does not. It, perhaps it could, but it does not, at least in its introduced form. Are we any closer in any other piece of legislation? This has been a subject for year after year after year after year of that need for some form of housing allowance, uh, you know, locality pay, whatever the vocabulary may be, and yet each year the discussion goes by the wayside. Well, uh, 
to your point, last year we did get a bill through that allows within what was the DHHR, now it's DHS, we, we broke it apart and uh, changed uh, names of the component agencies, but uh, for child protective service workers, we eliminated uh, any requirement of uniformity in pay, at least in our eastern panhandle. And so uh, if it requires um, the um, DHHR, what was the DHHR, to pay more to get child protective service workers employed and in the field in our eastern panhandle, the law no longer prohibits or constrains uh, that from happening. That passed in 2023. And uh, I think it's working. The reports I'm getting uh, have indicated, uh, the DHHR officials have indicated they have um, been able to fill a number of vacancies they had. Uh, now, they haven't been able to get them all deployed in the field yet because there are training programs they have to put them through before they can uh, you know, send them out into the field and doing that work. But I think we did we did make some progress in that area last year, and uh, I hope it's going to show some effects soon. I've always found it funny that the rest of the state is so happy to take the uh, money because we have a lot of higher income earners here in the eastern panhandle, which causes everything to be more expensive. The rest of the state's very happy to take all of our tax dollars to prop up the lower counties, the counties with lower incomes, the counties struggling. But in most areas, do not give us the ability to have the same level of services that they do. It's it's crazy. Yeah, and it it, it directly is related to the cost of the cost of living. There's no question about that. It's higher in the eastern Panhandle and perhaps Morgantown than than anywhere else in the state. So, but we have we have at least uh, made in one area of the law with the in the context of CPS workers, we've eliminated that as an impediment. You know, uh, years ago, you guys may Rob, I know you may remember this. Senator Unger was serving in the Senate mm -hmm. and got a bill through that allowed for an eastern panhandle pay deferential for highways workers. And um, same problem at the time. That was probably 10 years ago. And there were grievances, hundreds if not thousands of grievances, filed by employees, highways employees from all around the rest of the state. Uh, that it, it resulted in four or five years of litigation. Yeah, invite them all in up here to buy a house, Charlie. Let them let them see if they want to complain. That hey, I know you got to get to caucus. I don't want you to miss your opening prayer. I appreciate your time this morning, sir. Gentlemen, it's great talking to you. Uh, thank you for having me on. Thank you, Senator Charles Trump.